Okay, welcome everybody. Today we have uh, three speakers. All are coming from the University of Calgary and they have collaborated on the work, the title you can see here, Observing a Changing Hilbert Space in a Product, which is of course important for people who work on PT symmetry, but I think we will hear all about it in, in the seminar. Yeah, and the names you can read there. Um, I'm a bit afraid. So Barry Sanders, I can spell properly and pronounce properly. <laughs> Salini Kuravade. And I have to admit, I do not know the first name of Alesi. Uh, oh, that is written there. Um, Abhijit Alesi, sorry about that. Yeah. So whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks for uh, the kind introduction. And um, my student Shalini Karavade and postdoc Abhijit Alasi and I are very happy to be at this meeting. Um, we're going to talk to you about the uh, idea of a changing Hilbert space inner product. And it's very much related to the topic of this series of uh, seminars. Um, it's related to non-hermeticity, PT symmetry, and the rest. So uh, that's fine. And I think our change in our product caused the date to change. So we know that today is the 26th, that says the 25th, and that's our first observable. Um, the work that I'll talk about here, most of it's been published back in January in physical review research, but towards the end of the talk, we'll go a bit beyond what that material is. And we'll also dive a little bit deeper into the topics um, that uh, come up. Okay, can we go to the next slide, Shalini? Okay, so on the upper left, you can see an outline. Uh, we'll start off just introducing the topic. Um, and I think many here already have an expert background, uh, but I'll, I'll just give the introduction um, and the background on this topic. And it's important that we reach a common understanding of what, uh, what the material is, what it means, um, how inner product and PT symmetry and non-hermeticity all overlap with each other. We'll give the approach for how we tackle this problem. And uh, we'll tend to get a little bit into the mathematics side, um, use a C star algebra foundation, but we won't go heavy on the math. We're bringing in mathematical foundations just to make sure that we get right the ideas of changing inner product, um, but we're not trying to make it overly mathematical. And then we'll talk about the results that we got, including um, work that's not in the paper where we're collaborating with an experimental group on uh, simulating an inner product change. And then we'll draw our conclusions. You can see lots of ways to find me on multi on, on the media, social media, if you want to find me. And in the upper right, that's the city of Calgary photograph. So you can see where this work was done. Okay, next slide. Okay, so let's, um, uh, and again, I'm very aware that we have a lot of experts in the audience and sorry for anybody where this is trivial, but again, this is about getting the language ready. And for those that don't have this particular background, sorry to rush through it. Um, and uh, if Andreas is okay, I'm okay with interruptions during the talk, if it helps to clarify things. Otherwise we're okay with questions at the end. Um, so the uh, first thing is just to make clear what the inner product means in quantum mechanics. And so as we would all know, taking an undergraduate course on quantum mechanics, um, the idea is that every, you know, we're, we're told that every physical system is described by a Ray and Hilbert space and a Hilbert space is a complete inner product space. And the idea that the inner product is not unique is something we don't delve into. And we have very good work in the last couple of decades um, telling us why it didn't really matter. You know, that uh, it, the choice of inner product might not determine the physics. And we're not going into that here. We're not asking um, what would quantum mechanics be if we chose a different inner product. The point here is we're asking what would happen to quantum mechanics if the inner product were to change and change means that we have two stages. We have preparation and measurement. And we're not gonna go into the dynamical effects. We're not gonna talk about what happens as inner product changes, but rather um, just prepare a state and then measure it later, what would happen if the inner product were to change in between in some way that we're not going to get specific about. So when we say that Hilbert space is a complete inner product space, the way we think about it is that there's a pair of entities. So um, that script H is representing the Hilbert space. Then we write it as a pair of objects. The first object is script V, which is a vector space. And script I is the inner product. And when we allow the inner product to change, we don't change our vector space, 
but we do allow that inner product to change. What does the inner product do? It carries a Cartesian product of vector spaces, i.e. a pair of vectors into a complex number. And the way that we think about it, you know, again, just going back to undergraduate quantum mechanics is we have ket phi and ket psi are the two vectors in that vector space. And then the inner product is the overlap between the two. So we turn a ket into a bra, and then we get the complex number as the overlap between the bra phi and the ket psi. Um, the, everything that I'm talking about is really about how to turn a ket into a bra. So at the very basic level, we're just not taking for granted the process of turning a ket into a bra. Um, and more subtly, we're thinking that you know at, at uh, one point, um, there's one rule, and then the rule for turning a ket to a bra changes. And, uh, and the question is whether that's even allowed. You know, Does quantum mechanics allow that in a self-consistent way? And we're going to argue yes, but the yes argument is subject to one tweak of an axiom in C-star algebra. And so we're just going to be very open about what we're assuming, and then you can draw conclusions for yourself uh, whether inner product can change. But we're going to argue that it can. It, I mean, it's allowed. We're going to restrict this presentation to the changing inner product effect on quantum mechanics, um, not on the whole of physics. You know, so you can imagine that Maxwell's equations also deals with the Hilbert space. And if the inner product changes in some way, does that, what does that do to the rest of physics, like Maxwell's equations? And that's outside the scope of this work, but it has a lot of interesting implications. Okay, um, so for this particular slide, ket psi. Uh, we can think of as a description of preparation. I like to take a very operational quantum mechanics view. So to me, a state is a description of preparation. So if I tell you that I write a ket uh, representing an electron that's spin up, then to me, that's a language for telling you the electron is spin up. And then I assume that you know that you can take an electron source, direct it through electromagnetic fields, so that you're certain that you've prepared the electron and spin up or you, yeah, or you do some other thing. But when I say electron spin up and, and write a ket that way, that's just a shorthand description that I assume you and I both understand, tells us how to prepare a spin up. And then the measurement can be thought of as the bra and that's the ket, i oh, sorry, the bra phi there is the somehow a conjugate under the inner product rules for the ket and then a measurement tells us how to measure something. So if I say measure the spin of the electron, whether it's up or down, there's implied a basis choice, et cetera. And uh, um, sorry, can you move the mouse away, Shalini? Just to, yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so then uh, the bra phi just describes the measurement and the connection between cat and bra can be understood in various interpretations. You know, there's a um, two state vector formalism, for example, where we can think of the bra as a measurement as being a time reversal of a preparation and so on. So there's different ways to think about it. Um, and then that overlap is really just saying, what is the complex probability amplitude for something like, you know, prepare the electron in a particular spin state, measure it in some other spin. Um, what is that overlap? And that's the inner product. And the inner product carries two quantities that are important for this discussion. One is that the inner product implies a norm. So if the inner product changes, then the norm of a state could also change. And the second is the angle between the states. And if the inner product changes, the angle between the states can change. And then that means that two states that are not orthogonal could become orthogonal or vice versa as examples. So physically a changing inner product can affect the norm and affect the angle between the states and particularly allow orthogonality to vary in time. And then what we're claiming here is that quantum mechanics, as it's currently formulated, does not yet formally address the consequences of a changing inner product. So this is the point that we're uh, opening up here. Um, our aim here is to establish a quantum mechanical consistent framework for changing the Hilbert space inner product between preparation and measurement. So the way I like to think of it in a down to earth way is, imagine you wake up in the morning and Hilbert space has one inner product, and by the time you go to sleep, it has a different inner product and you prepare your system in the morning. And then when you go to sleep, you measure and the inner product has changed in the interim. Um, so now this aim is somewhat loaded because we're saying it should be a quantum mechanical consistent framework. There is speculation in the literature, particularly related to PT symmetry, that there could be advantages. And so when our aim is to 
discuss whether the Hilbert space inner product changing is consistent, we're, we're trying to work towards saying that the inner product could be allowed to change and it is consistent with quantum mechanics. So we're not looking for an advantage here. We are looking for it to be observable and I'll be clear what that means but we're, uh, we don't think it gives an advantage, but we're, you know, it's a debatable point. Um, so our aim here is to establish that framework. Um, we think it, there's no advantage to it, but we can't prove there's no advantage. So it's, it's up for discussion. Can I we go to the next? Question. Sure. Sorry. Uh, but th this measurement happens at one instant of time, right? Um, I mean, it can, we don't. It doesn't so happen we, in time, right? You're asking me if a measurement happens at an instant in time? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you said you prepare the state and then you do the measurement. But if there is a time gap between, you have to evolve your initial state, right? That's correct. So, but the, measure, the, 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 the operation that you do and you do the measurement it happens at one instant of time. We don't insist on it being, I mean, if we make it an instant of time, it's like a delta function in time. We don't insist on that. Um, we, we just have the idea of preparation and measurement in the traditional sense. Like, are you, th there's two issues that you're raising, Ali. One is, um, uh, one is whether preparation and measurement are instantaneous. And the second is whether there's a gap between, are, are these two separate issues in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So are you asking about whether we're insisting on it being instantaneous? I thought it should be instantaneous because of this vape collapse of gate function distance, which doesn't happen in time, but one instant of time, so. I'm, but then there's Planck scale arguments and all that. So um, mm. I, I, I'm not objecting, like our, our, uh, the way we formulated here is, con is um, con consistent with what you're saying, mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't want us to tie our whole theory to the idea that measurement has to be instantaneous. Okay. Okay, that's great. That's setting us up for some of the things to come. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to motivate um, why we're why we're working on this. Um, so the idea is that um, I mean, part of it is really just the question. You know, that uh, certainly once I understood that inner product didn't have to be unique, then um, is it uh, is it it, it, would it be allowed to, to have it change? And so um, Shalini Abhijit and I did a study of the literature and we just, we didn't find the answer to this particular question. So this is why we started studying it. Um, we do know uh, historically that, um, that uh, different inner product choices are uh, consistent with quantum mechanics. Um, and there is in, uh, okay, so you can see at the bottom references, um, our references refer to the DOI, the Digital Object Identifier, um, and the DOI service runs a hash uh, capability. So when you see 10 slash and then up to six alphanumeric characters, that's just the shorthand DOI for the paper. If you want to look it up, you can just go to doi.org and plug that 10 slash six character entry to find it. And Ali, this is your work in the first line, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So. Um, the idea here is that uh, we know that quantum mechanics is consistent for different inner product choices. And of course, quite relevant to this discussion, hermetizing uh, quasi-hermitian exact PT symmetric Hamiltonians. And that refers to two works, one by Scholz, Geyer, and Hane, and the other by Most of Azade. Um, but those papers do not uh, tell us what would happen if the inner product were to change between preparation and measurement. I think, Ali, that might be part of the, related to the question you asked, but I didn't understand it deeply enough to, to give it full justice. Um, so we do know that a changing inner product in the sense that quantum mechanics could have a different inner product is consistent with uh, quantum mechanics. But our claim is that we don't, didn't yet know whether if it changed between preparation and measurement, it's still consistent. The reason that we care about this, because if the inner product could change, maybe it would be advantageous. Um, so, uh, one would be quantum cloning. And this is work, uh, you can see the second entry, uh, John, Wang, Xiao, Bian, Zhang, and me, and then Zhang and Shui. This is Peng Shui's group at the Beijing Computational Science Center. It's an experimental paper. 
and it's just an example uh, of, of work that can be done. And in this one, we allow, we simulate the change of inner product, and then we do a cloning, quantum cloning. And for those people familiar with the quantum cloning literature, it branches into two areas. One is um, heralded perfect cloning. So it means that you can clone perfectly some of the time, but you don't know which times it will work. And the other direction in quantum cloning is, so we know that perfect quantum cloning all the time is impossible from famous paper by Witters and Zurek, it's due to linearity of quantum mechanics, but that um, heralded non-deterministic perfect cloning is one direction. And the other is every time imperfect cloning. And so our cloning result where we simulate the change of inner product is really um, a quantum, uh, is quantum cloning of the first kind, which is the heralded perfect cloning lab. So inner product change could be advantageous in that way. Um, but in the end, it's consistent with quantum mechanics because we don't break the bound on quantum cloning. The uh, second one is computation. And you can see reference three by Bender, Brody, Jones, and Meister. And they don't show this in the paper, but they do speculate on faster than Hermitian quantum mechanics. So they do ask whether there'd be a speed up. So if we could tweak the inner product, maybe we could deliver faster than Hermitian quantum mechanics. I said at the outset that we don't think there's an advantage. So by us establishing a framework, we think that these kinds of advantages would be ruled out, again, all subject to debate. And then um, the final block on this slide is uh, observation of exact PT symmetry. And although I'm sure many of you are experts on this topic, we'll go through the definition again. And so we know, uh, particularly from Brody's work, that quantum mechanics that for exact PT symmetry, there's no observable distinction um, for closed systems. Uh, for open systems, then exact PT symmetry might have observable consequences. So there's still a question mark there. So there are still, at, at least as far as we know, open questions that need resolution. And by developing a careful mathematical framework, we feel that it makes these kinds of questions um, more conveniently resolved. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, our, our claims and the novelty. So the claims are what we did, and the novelty is what we think makes our work different from others. Um, so our claim, first claim, is that we believe we've developed a framework, a mathematical framework, that is consistent with quantum mechanics that deals with the changing Hilbert space inner product. So I'm gonna show you that the inner product could change, that is consistent with quantum mechanics, but there is the caveat um, that we had to tweak one of the axioms in C-star algebra, and it's essentially the norm. It's whether, um, it, it, in a mundane sense, if you think of a density matrix and the trace is one, we allow the trace to be less than one. So we have to allow subunit norm, but we believe that's consistent. Um, the second uh, is, and this relates to the title of our presentation, observing that we think that the changing inner product is expressible as a quantum operation which means that it's almost like a quantum channel, except a quantum channel is a completely positive trace preserving map. The changing inner product is a uh, completely positive trace non-increasing map. So that means that the norm can decrease and, uh, and, and it's observable in the sense that one can imagine doing tomography of it. So you can imagine some tomographic tests of what goes on under different changing inner products. So we'll, we'll go into that. The third one is that we relate our framework to open PT symmetric dynamics. Um, and the fourth is that we show how to simulate that inner product change. So once we know it's a quantum operation, we can imagine something like a Krauss operator decomposition um, and use a Steinspring dilation and say, okay, well, there is a way to simulate it uh, by purifying the system. But from Steinspring dilation, we know that typically we would, well, uh, we, we would need the cube of the dimension uh, to be able to simulate it unitarily. So a qubit is two dimensional. We would, if we had a two cubed equals eight dimensional Hilbert space, then we could conceive of a way to simulate the inner product change. But in our work, we find that all we need is one extra Hilbert space dimension. So instead of needing three qubits or a q-oct to simulate inner product change on a qubit, we can do it with a q-trit. And we won't show it here, but for a q-trit, we could do it with a q-quart and so on. So we just need an, one extra dimension, which was a surprise to us. Um, the novelty, first of all, we do go back to C-star algebra. 
uh, to formalize and operationalize the changing inner product. Usually in theoretical physics, we have avoid a C star algebra framework. It seems to make things more complicated. The way we avoid it is that we, we just say observables are matrices or are derivatives or whatever. So we just, um, you know, we, we, we uh, equate the representation to the object in the algebra. But if we're changing the inner product, we can no longer do it. The, even the concept of how to construct rows and columns of a matrix uh, have to be considered carefully if the inner product is to change. Um, second, we employ the freedom in the Hilbert space representation to construct the quantum operation implementing the inner product change. And by employing the freedom in the Hilbert space representation, what we mean is, uh, and this goes back to the angle norm aspect of what I uh, talked about for um, inner product change, um, we regard a basis change as being trivial. Um, so the any aspect of an inner product change that's simply a basis change, we uh, we feel that we can strike that out and then just go to the norm behavior. But the the change of the representation could mean you know that what was spin up in the morning could be spin plus, which is the superposition of up and down with a plus sign in the evening. So there, there's the basis chain aspect that needs to be resolved through communication and the norm change. And then we try to exploit that as much as possible by incorporating the um, basis change into uh, a part of a protocol. And then finally, the um, idea of operationalizing PT symmetry via inner product change is novel. It's the operationalization aspect. Okay, next slide, please. Um, all right, so now uh, this just gives some background. Um, this is not meant to be exhaustive. It's just meant to be, you know, four uh, screen captures to fill the screen, just to give some basic background. Uh, and, and I'll just go through this. And again, I'm sure a lot of people here are experts, but just to make sure we're on the same page. In the upper left, you can see a snapshot of the Physical Review Letters article from 1998 by Bender and Bocher. Real spectra and non-Hermitian Hamiltonian having PT symmetry. I won't discuss that here. I assume that people uh, know it very well, but of course you can ask at the end. But in my mind, this is a seminal work that really opens this field and asks very important questions. And of course, you all know that PT is not your garden variety particle physics PT of point reflection and time reversal, but um, mathematical extraction, abstractions of those being um, linear and anti-linear isometries on Hilbert space. And then uh, below, you can see Ali Mostafazadeh's work, a snapshot of that work from 2003. Um, and so this work uh, in our minds is extremely important. It proves that exact PT symmetry is equivalent to hermeticity. And so in the uh, upper left, you can see Bender and Bocher are saying, talking about non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and then Ali Mostafazadeh is saying, uh, in you know, exact PT3 is equivalent. So the question of what does it mean to even talk about non-hermeticity um, is, is uh, put into a nice mathematical framework. And we, we like that paper a lot. In the upper right, then you can see Brody's work about consistency of PT symmetric quantum mechanics, uh, which we regard as uh, very important to our work. Uh, and so between these three papers, opening the door to these kinds of questions, proving equivalence to hermeticity and showing the consistency with quantum mechanics are the uh, seminal ideas that we uh, take into our work. And then in the lower right is the work I mentioned where we allow an inner product change. We also cast it in the framework of PT symmetry. And then we do that experimental quantum cloning and our quantum cloning result is of, of what I think of as type one quantum cloning. It's the heralded non-deterministic uh, um, perfect quantum clone up to perfect up to experimental error. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, uh, this one is just getting the mathematical foundation of PT symmetry right. Again, I keep repeating, I think you're experts on it, but let's just make sure we're on the same page. Um, so first of all, we define PT and we'll use the upright font PT to refer to parity time as the words, you know, representing the concepts, and then the slanted or italic P and T is representing operators. Um, so we have P and T operations. And as I said earlier, P and T are linear and anti-linear isometries on the Hilbert space. P and T both square to be the identity and they commute. 
So if there's a PT symmetry, then, um, then the P and T can be any such operators on Hilbert space uh, that, that satisfy those properties. And so if they satisfy those properties, then it's allowed to talk about those as PT. Once we have P and T, then we define the PT symmetric Hamiltonian. So if a Hamiltonian is PT symmetric, we put a subscript of a slanted PT. So the slanted font PT indicates that it's the Hamiltonian associated with the given operators P and T, not that the Hamiltonian is conceptually a PT symmetric Hamiltonian. We wanna be very careful about this because we want the Hamiltonian to be associated with specific choices of P and T or, uh, yeah, that's good. Then, um, so the way that we define it is, uh, again, we would have liked to pull the definition of the literature. We weren't able to find one that we could pull, but we're, you know, if anybody here wants to tell us later of a good definition, we'll use it. But for the time being, we just define it ourselves. So we say given P and T that satisfy those two properties and given a Hamiltonian H and our Hamiltonian doesn't have to be Hermitian, um, then uh, we declare that that Hamiltonian is PT symmetric with respect to that choice of PT if the Hamiltonian commutes with PT. And then the exact PT symmetry uh, arises if HPT and PT share all eigenvectors, which then implies that the eigenvalues of HPT are real. And this goes back to Bender and Bolker, and we're being extra careful here. Um, we're avoiding the term spectrum. We talk about the eigenvalues because in the infinite dimensional case where notions of hermeticity have to be dealt with carefully, also the spectrum has to be dealt with carefully when there's a continuous spectrum. And so in this case, the sharing of eigenvectors and the eigenvalues uh, that formulation avoids extra complication that comes up in the infinite dimensional case. And so a lot of stuff we'll talk about here is finite dimensional, but it doesn't need to be. Um, but in talking about hermeticity, it's certainly safer to stay with finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, okay, then we have uh, uh, the idea that exact PT symmetry is equivalent to quasi hermeticity. And this goes back to Ali Mostafazadeh's work. We'll deal with finite dimensional Hilbert space and then let's just introduce the, the slanted M as an operator. And so here, again, I wanna be careful. We'll, when we talk about the C-star algebra, we'll talk about an object A, which is an observable in the C-star algebra, um, and we'll, uh, or a member of the C-star uh, algebra. And then when we talk about a, an operator like here, M, M is B of, in B of H, and H is the Hilbert space. B of H is the set of trace class bounded operators on the Hilbert space. So M in this case, is a linear operator, uh, bounded trace class linear operator on Hilbert space. Um, and that would be a representation of an element of the algebra. And so then we know, um, going back to most of Azadi's work that for all finite dimensional diagonalizable exact PT symmetric Hamiltonians H subscript PT, there exists a metric operator. Um, so in this case, it's self-adjoint, so eta equals eta dagger under the given inner product. The greater than zero tells us it's positive, such that, and then this is essentially a redefinition of what it means to take the conjugate. And so instead of saying that the Hamiltonian is um, self-conjugate, that h dagger equals h, for given pt, we know that the existence of that eta um, allows us to construct uh, an eta such that the the dagger, the, the conjugation under the existing inner product, and then conjugating under eta, and by conjugation, it's got an eta inverse on the left and an eta on the right. Um, so eta inverse h dagger pt eta equals h pt. And the importance of doing it under conjugation is that um, it, it has very nice properties. And the one you can see immediately, uh, well, first of all, the sum property comes out immediately, but also products, the product of different operators under conjugation is the product of their conjugated operators. So it's a very nice property to have proven. And then we define the Hermitian conjugate in the last line. And this is where we take that operator in Hilbert space uh, and just have the usual rules. So we're just showing you how we, um, what our notation is for writing um, uh, hermeticity. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now I wanna talk about our operational approach. And so for this, we need to be especially careful about states. Now, uh, usually in quantum mechanics, we'll think of a state like you know, something like a row, a density operator, 
But um, because of this playing around with the inner product, we have to be extra careful. So this is why we fall back to C-star algebras is that we want to be able not only to talk about the algebra separate from the representation, but we also have to think a little bit carefully about um, the mapping from a state as a linear functional to the state as an operator. And um, so we have the C-star algebra A. Uh, I'm not going to go into the definition of C-star algebra. We don't need to go through that in detail here. and We don't have time, but it's, it's look upable if anybody wants to check. Uh, C-star algebra comprises self-adjoint observables. Um, there's a star operation. So the star operation is the conjugation. In mathematics, we'll conjugate with a star. In physics, we typically conjugate with a dagger. In our notation, we're going to use both. So when we're going to use the star to conjugate elements in the algebra and the dagger to conjugate elements in the representation of the algebra, because we're changing inner product, the rule for uh, conjugation in the representation depends on the inner product. And so states are linear functionals. Um, and uh, the way I like to think about it, like if you think of the outcome of a measurement, suppose you have a measurement operator M and you have a density matrix rho, then the outcome is given by trace rho M. So we often talk about rho as the state, but technically we should think of trace rho blank as the state. So trace rho blank and we plug M in, then we'll get uh, a number. But, um, the, but it's convenient to think of rho as the state and then the trace is something we add in. And that's kind of the, this is where the mapping from states to operators comes in. So the trace row blank is a linear function. It would map an element of, of uh, a representation of A into a number. So um, states are linear functionals on the C star algebra. And then you can see the omega in this case, if we take A star A, which is self adjoint in the algebraic level, and that's greater than or equal to zero. And then we have another property in the C star algebra that omega of identity is equal to one. And then I put in red here, or we put in red, the um, to indicate to you that we changed the rule. So we don't wanna pull the wool over your eyes. Um, instead of the textbook approach of saying that omega of identity equals one, we're allowing it to be less than or equal to one. This allows norm decreasing. And this is something that, um, we think is consistent with quantum mechanics. But if you want to argue, this is a good point to argue because our, you know, in, we, we're saying that our results are consistent with quantum mechanics and yet we've changed that particular rule. Okay, then once we agree on what states are, then the way we go from states to operators is under the GNS or gelfand neymark siegel construction. And this um, gives us a star representation of the algebra and the states. And so here, the idea is that if we look at the first bullet and then we take the C star algebra A and we map it under pi to B of H. And then um, this is something like, you know, if, if for me, okay, let me talk about that as a theoretical physicist. So let's say we have a Pauli operator and then we have a Pauli matrix. And typically in physics, we'll say the Pauli matrix, you know, if I say to you, what is sigma X, and then you write a, a two by two matrix, zero, one and one, zero in the two rows. Um, that is not the Pauli uh, operator, but it's a representation of the Pauli operator. Saying they're equal is very typical and okay in quantum mechanics, but mathematically that's what pi is doing. Pi is just saying we have the algebraic relations for Pauli operators, and then we can write the matrices for them. So now you have a good feeling of what pi is. Now we introduce sharp pi. So sharp, that symbol sharp or pound or hash is written in red. It's a standard symbol for a pullback in mathematical physics, but we're using it in um, the GNS construction for the first time that we know of. So we just put it in red to warn you that that's not a standard symbol, but we are trying to be true to the mathematical literature. So in that case, you can see that the sharp pi is defined by pi, which gives the representation. And then sharp pi pulls us from a, um, a, a representation of, well, from a linear operator to a state. Um, and so we have to be careful with that also as we change the inner product. And then we have the property that pi of A star. So A star is the conjugate at the C star algebra level. And so pi A star equals pi of A dagger is telling us that our pi has the property that the conjugate of A, um, that is then the representation of the conjugate of A is the conjugate of the representation of A 
where the left side, the conjugation is done at the algebraic level and the right side, the conjugation is done at the um, representation level. So you can think of it matrices or differential operators. And then the second bullet is just to make it less abstract. If you then think of a density operator rho, um, then an omega is the state, then sharp pi is what carries us from rho to omega. So I said before that if you think of trace rho m as giving the outcome, then the trace rho together would be omega. And so the effect of sharp pi here is just to put the trace back in. And in theoretical physics, usually these are thought to be so trivial, we don't need to talk about, but in our work, we're just trying to be extra careful with this. And then the pure state is just um, represented by that projection, cat psi, bra psi under pi for any uh, cat psi and H. So it just reminds you how to relate a pure state omega with its, uh, um, with its representation of a C star algebra element. Okay, and then the final block is telling us that um, uh, we now have to allow for different representations. So pi allows us to represent elements of the C star algebra as bounded operators on the Hilbert space. But if we change the inner product of Hilbert space, we have to change the representation and we need to be careful about that. And that's what pi prime does. So pi prime is just representing on the new Hilbert space. And you remember that the new Hilbert space has the same vector space, but just a change in the inner product. And then as we know from work by Mos Vizzotti and Brody, there's an observational indistinguishability. So omega is the state. Um, the way I think about it, omega maps an element of the C star algebra to trace of rho pi, the representation of A. And if we change the representation of A, we change the representation of rho as well. And they kind of cancel out. That's, that's a simple way that I think about it, but we're, being, we're trying to be rigorous on this. Okay, let's go to slide eight. Um, now slide eight has we, a lot of math. A, sorry, Barry, we have a question in the chat. Do you want to ask the question? Sure, I'm ready to take it. The person, Ranjit, do you want to ask the question or I can read it out if you want? Uh, hi, uh, are, uh, it seems to me that you are using the terms uh, uh, quasi Hermitian and uh, uh, pseudo Hermitian interchangeably. I think what you have is pseudo Hermitian and not quasi Hermitian, the equality to, you know, bit symmetric. Okay, can I? Uh, uh, Re refer that question to Shalini, please. Uh, hello. Yeah. So we we are referring to those non-Hermitian Hamiltonians for which the metric operator is strictly positive definite. Uh, so we we chose to call them quasi-Hermitian uh, uh, following the ninety-two paper by Schultz, Kerr, Hane, etc., uh, where they um, refer to a set of non-Hermitian operators uh, that are effectively Hermitian with respect to a positive definite operator to be quasi-Hermitian. So that, that's the language that we have been following. Uh, ho ho hope that answers the question. Uh, Ranjit, are you okay with that answer? Uh, well, uh, there's a bit unclarity. I mean, in literature, uh, sometime there was some distinguishing uh, features were, uh, you know, highlighted between quasi Hermitian and pseudo Hermitian. The definition what you wrote seems to me uh, more like, uh, you know, pseudo Hermitian when you uh, wrote the definition of, uh, uh, you know, equality. Okay. Uh, yeah, we. So, okay, so we acknowledge uh, but that. It's just a lexicon uh, uh, disagreement, I guess. So okay. Thanks, Ranjit. Can... Yeah, we. Ranjit, we, we understand that there's different language used. And then as Shalini pointed out, we just picked a reference um, in the peer reviewed literature and followed that. But we understand that, that it is a debatable point. We'd be happy to follow up with you. Maybe I can make a comment. I think it goes back to some papers in the 60s by Dudeney. He, he seems to be the one who coined the expression quasi emission. And he, in, 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 I mean, mathematically, it means that your eta does not possess an inverse, but is positive definite, whereas pseudo emission means it does possess an inverse and it's not necessarily positive. I think that's the mathematical definition going back to the 60s in the mathematics literature. Did we know that, Shalini? I, th this is new information for me. No, this is new information to uh, us. Yeah, thanks for okay. pointing that out. That yeah, can thank send the references if you like. Yeah, please do, and, and thanks. So we've learned something important. Yes, thank you. 
Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so thanks for that. So now uh, on slide eight, um, this one has a lot of math and we won't go into the mathematics in detail, it's here. And if we need to with questions, we're happy to do so. Um, but this is really the idea that we wanna make sure that our rules for representations are do hold up under changing inner product. Um, and so you can see in the heading for this slide, it's got I subscript EDA. So we use so we use eta. So eta is the metric operator, uh, and as we just talked about, it's an invertible metric operator, and we we also use that as a label. So you can see that the changing inner product matches the Hilbert space. We don't have a subscript there because we just uh, we're not worried what the initial inner product is, and then it changes to h eta, where eta represents the change of inner product, and so we use eta both as the operator and as a label for the new Hilbert space, and then the Hilbert space is the pair. V and I, the vector space and the inner product. And so you can see the vector space doesn't change, but the new inner product is labeled by that metric operator. And you can see in the first block that the new inner product uh, just carries the Cartesian product of the vector space with itself into complex numbers by um, taking two kets, ket phi and ket psi, and then mapping it to bra phi and then ket eta psi. So the rule, the changing inner product has the rule that we can just multiply by eta. This is known in the literature, but we're just introducing it. We're just, form it, we're just presenting it here to complete the story. And then on the far right, you can see that we have an eta subscript. So we just refer to the overlap between phi and psi under the changed inner product by putting a subscript eta. So the subscript eta on that inner product um, is, again, that's the metric operator that's labeling it. And then the next block has all the math. I'll just give you the basic idea that we then want to make sure that the new representation, which we call pi eta, maps the C star algebra elements to bounded operators on H eta. And then that involves a conjugation. Um, but instead of it being conjugated by eta and eta inverse, it's conjugated by the square root of eta and the square root of uh, and the inverse of the square root of eta is how the representation works. And then that can be written as a composition where we take the element A in the C star algebra, represent it in B of H, and then apply R, uh, R subscript eta. So the representation can be done in that way. And then using that information, those three bullets are just telling us that the representation under a change of inner product is well behaved, that we can rep that the representation of the sum is the sum of representation, the representation of a product is the product of representations. And then the final bullet checks that the representation of the star is well, well behaved. And then you can see here that we have a dagger, as I said before. So this star is the at the algebra level, the dagger is the conjugation at the, um, uh, at the linear operator level. But we also introduce a double dagger. I mean, we should have done something like a dagger subscript eta, but we, it's too messy. So we're just using a double dagger to represent the adjoint with respect to the new inner product. And then we go through the four sub bullets to show those properties and we won't put time into that now, but it's there in case we need to come back to it for questions. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And here I'll hand it. So I, Shalini and Abhijit did the work on this. And I think one of the nice things about virtual presentations is the students and postdocs can present. So Abhijit will present this slide and then pass it to Shalini. Thank you so much, Barry. Uh, so in, in the literature, we, uh, um, in the literature on PT symmetry, we, we have a lot of papers talk about inner product change. And naturally there are two Hilbert spaces that come into picture in, for which the inner product is related by a metric operator eta. And what Barry explained in the last slide is that uh, we choose to view them as two different uh, representations of the C star algebra A. Uh, and this is the slide where perhaps our work starts deviating a little bit from um, uh, a good number of papers on this topic, and I will explain how. So here we are going to define what we mean by an inner product change. Uh, and we take the viewpoint that inner product change is, uh, is in fact a, uh, an active transformation, meaning it could be observable, but we don't assume that we are rather going to derive that. So on the lowest rung of the, uh, on the figure on the left, the commutative diagram on the left, 
you will see that there is a map i eta which takes h to h eta. Uh, as a, this is the map that we want to think of as the inner product change. Um, and so while it, is an, while it is a linear isomorphism from H to H eta uh, uh, is, is obvious, we want to, we, we first started thinking about what should this map be so that we, should, we can call it as an inner product change and do justice to the literature. So we took inspiration from the fact that inner product change should be um, uh, uh, applicable for implementing quasi quasi Hermitian, I mean, pit, exact PT symmetric dynamics, and, and that it should be helpful in, for example, tasks like um, uh, uh, probabilistic discrimination of non-orthogonal states. And so it became very clear to us that this map is in fact the map that takes the ket psi to another ket psi from H to H eta, uh, but notice that the inner product of H and H eta is different. So I will warn you that uh, even though this map is taking ket psi to ket psi, uh, it is not. It, it might actually be changing the changing the state itself because the ket psi represents two different states in the representation on H and representation on H eta. So to make this more clear, we now consider the lift map, which takes a ket psi and brings it to an observable level in B of H. So in standard quantum mechanics, this is done by lifting ket psi to ket psi bra psi. So that is the lift map we are seeing on the left. But if we are in the Hilbert space H eta, then we have to use the appropriate rules for, for lifting, especially we have to use the bra that corresponds to the eta inner product. And so the lift eta of ket psi is actually different than lift of psi. We get psi psi eta in that case. And by completing this commutative diagram, we found that the, uh, the correct map that corresponds to uh, this change on the observable level is the map E eta, which takes an, any operator M to operator M times eta. Uh, so what we found here was that if our eta is less than or equal to the representation of identity, then this map E eta is completely positive and trace non-increasing. And therefore, in this case, we could interpret that as a physically implementable uh, uh, operation. Uh, we can, in fact, even uh, use our sharp pi and sharp pi eta maps, and um, that would be uh, uh, that would allow us to think of these operations directly on the level of states, which are linear functionals on sister algebra. We denote that operation as e tilde eta, but we will not ne really need to use that uh, for the rest of the talk. Now, this operation e eta, which goes from b of h to b of h eta is somewhat unusual because we are used to thinking of operations that go from B of H to B of H, like the channels that go from B of H to B of H. But notice that E eta can simply be decomposed as, uh, as, as a completely positive trace non-increasing map F eta that is on B of H to B of H, particularly that acts as M goes to eta to the power half, M eta to the power half. And the second component R eta is just the representation change and this is essentially like, um, you know, uh, in a lot of papers, we think about quasi hermeticity as um, uh, just a relabeling or uh, just a basis change, a non orthogonal basis change in which we are representing unitary processes. So here, R eta is just that representation change. So through this, we are advocating the point of view that inner product change is a non trivial channel. Uh, and uh, it's a composition of two processes, one which is a, tr a completely positive trace non-increasing map and other is the representation change. And because representation change is operationally equivalent to doing nothing, uh, the map F eta from B of H to B of H is in fact operationally equivalent to E eta. Uh, and this can, we can in fact perform a, a pro process tomography to uh, exactly identify what channel F eta is being implemented and obtain eta as, a, as the square of cross operator for that map. Uh, Shalini will take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Abhijit already talked about how we chose to operationalize this change in inner product uh, using the tools of C star algebra. So now I'm going to take a step back and come back to uh, the PT symmetric Hamiltonians that we started off with. Um, so in this slide, I'll be talking about how our operational framework uh, provides insight into implementing dynamics that are generated by exact PT symmetric Hamiltonians. Uh, <clears throat> so the question here is, how do we implement uh, uh, 
a time evolution, uh, the non-unitary time evolution that is generated by a non-Hermitian but exact pt symmetric Hamiltonian HPT. So naively, we can think of uh, the implementation procedure in the following way. We can uh, first think of, uh, in the first step, we change the in, uh, inner product of the Hilbert space uh, on which our quantum state is represented. So if the Hilbert space is H, we change the inner product from H to H eta. And then in H eta, <coughs> thanks to the fact that uh, HPT is exact PT, uh, PT symmetric. We know that in the new uh, Hilbert space, HPT is a Hermitian Hamiltonian. So therefore, we can implement the dynamics uh, uh, generated by HPT as unitary dynamics uh, in the new Hilbert space, H eta. And then finally, we have to come back to the same Hilbert space that we started off with. So we can uh, do a reverse of the change in inner product to come back to the uh, original Hilbert space. And we'll have the evolution generated by PT symmetric Hamiltonian. So this is a very uh, uh, nice way to think about uh, our prescription for implementing the dynamics. Uh, <clears throat> from the uh, in a more rigorous fashion what this means is that uh, suppose hpt is given to us and uh, for the time being let's assume that we are working with pure states and unknown pure state psi uh, 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 unknown quantum state that is represented by the vector psi is given to us um, and then uh, the task we have at hand is to implement e raised to minus i hpt t where t is the time divided by h bar uh, on this psi so what we do is that um, uh, so I invite your attention to the commutative diagram that we have shown in the figure, the lower rung of the diagram in particular. So we start off with the uh, quantum state that is now represented by psi uh, and then apply the isomorphism i eta, which takes psi to uh, psi in h eta in the new Hilbert space. So here we have to pay attention to the fact that this new psi may not uh, need not be representing the quant same quantum state anymore. It is representing some other quantum state. Um, and now, we have psi in H eta, we apply uh, UPT, which is a unitary operator in H eta, uh, so that the answer is UPT psi. And now we have to change the effect of, um, change the, uh, reverse the change of inner product. So for that, we uh, apply the isomorphism I root kappa eta inverse and root kappa eta inverse, we can show that this particular isomorphism essentially reverses the change uh, induced by I eta up to a scaling factor kappa. So we are left with the PT symmetric dynamics that we require up to this root kappa factor. So the root kappa factor comes because the inverse change in uh, the reverse change in inner product is induced by a metric operator eta inverse. But eta inverse uh, can be uh, can lead to uh, quantum operations that are trace increasing. So in order to prevent that from happening, we are uh, choosing a suitable scaling factor as you can see in the uh, in the slide here kappa we choose to be one over um, operator norm of eta inverse just so that uh, all the quantum operations that we deal with are strictly trace non increasing so what this means for general mixed state states is that we start with a quantum state that is represented by the density operator rho in b of h then we apply uh, the inner product changing operation e eta so that we have a new quantum state rho eta with us and then uh, after that we apply a unitary quantum channel uh, that acts on b of h eta uh, which essentially implements the Krauss operator that uh, that is related to our exact pt symmetric hamiltonian and finally we apply e kappa eta inverse which is the quantum um, operation that reverses the change in inner product that we first uh, applied and brings our uh, quantum system back to be represented on the Hilbert space uh, B of H. Uh, so this uh, this gives us a, um, a nice uh, but simple uh, decomposition of uh, exact PT symmetric dynamics in terms of uh, inner product changing operations and unitary channels. Um, so uh, th this brings us to the last point that we want to talk about. Um, so this way of decomposing PT symmetric dynamics uh, can be used to simulate PT symmetric, exact PT symmetric dynamics on quantum systems. So all we have to do is find a way to simulate each of the component in the decomposition of UPT that we have shown in the slide. Um, so in this slide, I'll only talk about how to simulate the first component in the decomposition, namely the change in inner product due to eta. Um, so we could figure out that if we are working with a qubit PT symmetric Hamiltonian, then the simulation of change in inner product can be done by only adding one extra Hilbert space dimension. So we are working with the Q-trig for the simulation. Um, 
so this this uh, very simple cutrid simulation strategy uh, we are uh, currently implementing it on rigetti uh, rigetti's aspen series cutrid based superconducting processor uh, so we are using this superconducting processor to first simulate the change in inner product on it and then further to use it to uh, further to use our pro uh, protocol to uh, implement uh, exact PT symmetric dynamics on the quantum computer. Uh, so our cutrid uh, simulation strategy is rather intuitive. So we are given uh, the qubit state row. Uh, we embed the qubit state row onto the first two levels of the cutrid system. And then, um, as Abhijit mentioned, our inner product changing operation E eta is operationally equivalent to another uh, op operation F eta if we do not uh, take into consideration the change in representation. So we work with F eta because we are ultimately doing a simulation of the change in inner product um, and change in representation is something that operationally has no effect. Uh, so this, uh, once we have the qubit state encoded into the qubit state, we apply uh, U eta, which is the unitary that encodes the action of F eta onto the state. And finally, we do a projective measurement onto the first two levels of the cutis system. So we get the inner product changed uh, um, row back to us. Um, so uh, if we think about this, this protocol, we see that um, this only requires one extra Hilbert space dimension, like Barry mentioned, a naive approach to Steinstring dilating uh, PT, non unitary PT symmetric dynamics would require three qubits and entangling gates. But this procedure only requires a qubit uh, and no entangle, and entangling operations. But we are aware that in the literature, we have uh, simulations of qubit PT symmetric dynamics using two qubits and entangling operation. So this goes one step ahead uh, uh, further, I would say. Um, and now that we are also uh, collaborating with Rigetti on implementing these kind of operations on their cutrid uh, uh, superconducting processes. We are also, uh, we also wanted to develop a, a verification scheme that can benchmark the quality of implementing, implementing inner product changing operations. Uh, so uh, to develop this verification protocol, we considered a specific adversarial model. So I discussed how in order to implement change in inner product using cutrid operations, we need cutrid unitaries so we consider an, an adversary who tries to cheat uh, by no, not using uh, a, actual qubit unitaries to implement this uh, simulate the change in inner product. Instead, they only use qubit unitaries that are uh, that are fully embeddable on the first two levels of the uh, of the qubit system. Um, so we could show that if our adverse, uh, if the agent that is supposed to simulate the change in inner product cheats in this fashion, then uh, if we take the uh, Shatten one to one norm distance of the process that is implemented by this adversary and uh, uh, versus the ideal operation F eta of rho that is to be implemented by the honest agent. We can see that the minimum achievable distance in this case uh, is uh, bounded above by one third lambda one minus lambda two, where lambda one and lambda two um, belongs to the spectrum of the metric operator. Uh, so this kind of a threshold condition that we give here allows us to certify whether the agent that simulates the change in inner product is honest or not um, uh, with respect to the particular adversarial model that we are considering. And uh, from the QTED procedure, we could also do a uh, rather straightforward extension. We could show that uh, exact PT symmetric dynamics uh, for D-dimensional systems can be implemented by using only 2D dimensions as opposed to D-cube dimensions um, by following a very similar procedure that we have presented here. Uh, but we, we haven't given the proofs in the slides, of course. So this brings us to the conclusion of our talk and uh, Barry will be giving us the conclusion slide. Hey, thank you, Shalini. Thank you, Abhijit. Um, I think uh, we're on the hour, Andreas. So um, what I'd prefer to do is just to leave the conclusion slide up and then accept questions as long as- Well, you can, still, you can still discuss it. I think we don't have to be so strict. Okay, well, so our, the conclusion, we have the four main points as the take home message. Number one is, you know, and subject to the caveats that we were, uh, we made clear that we think inner product change is consistent with quantum mechanics. And I said at the outset, and I remind you that the implications on physics itself need to be carefully considered and, and haven't been done here, but within a purely mathematical framework for quantum mechanics it's consistent. Second, that the, inner products that we allow are equivalent to applying a quantum operation, i.e. a completely positive trace non-increasing map, followed by a change in representation. And the change in representation is essentially just like a basis change. 
so it's really the norm decreasing part that has uh, important physical consequences. The third point is that the inner product change can be leveraged to implement PT symmetric dynamics. So we tie the two together. And finally, um, we're collaborating with an experimental group to uh, simulate um, PT symmetric qubit dynamics, well, not dynamic, but the, the inner product change using a single Qtrit. And then as Shalini just made clear, uh, we need an adversarial model to claim success. No experiment's perfect. So we have our Shatten one-to-one -one norm induced distance um, as a way of considering uh, limitations on an adversary and what would constitute proof that we've simulated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank all the three speakers, Abhijit, Salini, and Barry for the really nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Sorry, can I ask a question? Doji, yeah. Hi, so this is Doji Brody. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so I must admit the, the results, but uh, I didn't fully follow it, it went through uh, rather quickly. But uh, it wasn't immediately obvious to me where this uh, trace reduction property enters the dynamics. And before I pass on to you, uh, let me phrase my question in a slightly different way. So about 10 years ago, there's a paper that I wrote with Uwe Gunther and Carl Bender and a few others, where we noted that if you take, as an example, a perfect uh, or unambiguous quantum state discrimination, which I'm sure you're quite familiar with, uh, that of course happens with only a small amount of probability. And you can sort of replicate that or simulate that, I think is what the word we used in the paper, uh, using PT symmetric uh, Hamiltonian. In other words, if you have two states that are non orthogonal, and you can change the inner product in such a way that they are orthogonalized. And then with uh, one shot measurement, you can determine perfectly which one is the correct one. But of course, the downside is that that only happens with uh, a small probability. And I was trying to see where your trace decreasing property enters the picture here, whether that's the essence of what's being done here or not. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, uh, so I'll give a short answer, then I'll pass it over to Shalini. But um, the paper that Dorje just mentioned, Shalini, that's the one we cite, isn't it? Shalini, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. can, yes. Sorry, Is yes or no? Yes. I agree with you. Can you just go to the slide that we cite the paper? Okay, um, so is that the one you're referring to, Dorja? Uh, no, not that one. Oh, okay. It's about the <laughs> unambiguous quantum state discrimination. Uh, right, uh, but, but the paper by uh, Jean Wang et al. Uh, uses the protocol that was originally proposed. Uh, okay, so that one, yeah, that one uses it and then cites it. Okay, and then let me just jump to the part. So what you're asking, Dorja, is you know, essentially, where does the um, uh, decreasing trace come in? Mm -hmm. And then you did mention how um, there's a decreased probability of success. So the mm -hmm. decreased probability of success is what's manifested in the decreasing trace. Um, Shalini or Abhijit, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, so uh, so in, in this, uh, in the particular framework of sister algebra that we consider, we are uh, considering all set of states that are um, that have a maximum norm of up to one. Um, so any any uh, a linear functional, positive linear functional on the sister algebra that has subunit norm, this we associate with probabilistic preparations of uh, a quantum system. Um, so when we change the inner product, because uh, change in inner product is a tra trace non-increasing quantum operation, um, for some states, uh, as we apply this E, e, e down to those states, the resultant state that we get have subunit norm. And according to our interpretation, what they mean is that these states are probabilistically prepared. So that means with some probability, uh, as we change the inner product, we can lose the system. So uh, th that that's the uh, probabilistic 
aspect coming into our analysis. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Can I add a one quick comment just because it's one of my favorite topics in, in this uh, subject I'd like to talk about. Shalini, could you please go to slide nine? Uh, yes, so the specifically where we get uh, trace reduction comes into picture. The first place is, in fact, already you can see is H i eta goes to H eta. So here psi goes to psi. And so, um, a trace reduction on operator level essentially manifests as norm reduction on the Hilbert space level. So here, if, um, if the norm of psi was not changing under this map i eta, then we could immediately conclude, in fact, that eta equal to identity, and that's just a trivial inner product change, meaning inner product is not changing. So the only possibility is that some of the sides have to undergo norm reduction. Uh, if they're going, uh, if their norm is increasing, that means it is an unphysical operation because in our framework, trace increasing is not allowed. So uh, on this lowest strength already, this I eta operation uh, for any eta that's different than identity always reduces the norm of some states. Uh, and this is this is where the uh, probability loss, as Barry said, uh, uh, in your scheme, um, what you saw as a probability loss will be captured by this probability loss in our inner product change. And, and this holds for um, many different uh, many different tasks, including state discrimination, state cloning, where there is just evolution of PT symmetric dynamics as well. Okay, thank you. Any more comments, questions? I have one. Uh, Joshua. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, talk. Uh, I, I just want to put uh, things in context for uh, a practical context, I mean, something tangible. So you, you mentioned uh, uh, the role of the, of, the, of the bra is the measurement. And uh, one way to interpret uh, the change of metric is the, uh, some change in the way your measurement uh, apparatus uh, uh, is tuned. Instead of measuring sigma z, it will measure sigma x or whatever. So can I think of, of your proposal in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, usually a, a measuring system should be macroscopic, uh, therefore has very small fluctuations. So we know what we really measure. But if I, if I try to miniaturize uh, to, uh, the measuring apparatus, uh, at some point it becomes uh, quantum and starts fluctuating. So uh, I will have to, Will I, will I be able to interpret your work as ter in terms of such quantum behavior of the apparatus? Um, so that's a, a very interesting perspective. I'll, I'll give you the perspective that um, we're following, where we, we still keep macroscopic measurement. Shalini, can you go to the slide with the QTRIP protocol? So um, I think, Joshua, the, probably the, uh, the way we look at it, um, is okay. So first of all, we're, we're dealing with inner product change as being fundamental. So um, we're just saying mathematically, there's an inner product change. But on this slide, and this is our experimental collaboration, is that we're um, simulating it in terms of a Q-trip. So the way that I think about it is, um, imagine that you have a system that you believe to be spin half, like an electron spin up or down. But suppose that nature didn't tell you, but electrons really are have three levels. They're not spin half. They could be spin one or more generally like some SU3 dynamic on it. Um, then if nature really had three level electrons, but all our apparatuses only, all we're ever able to do is prepare and measure in the two level subsystem, then that could simulate this inner product change. And then you can see in the block at the top that we take rho, which could be a density matrix for you know, a spin half electron, and then we embed it into a three by three matrix, do our operations on that, and then project down the two level subsystem at the end. So rather than like, but remember that um, this is a simulation of the inner product change. In that sense, it would be that our app, that there happens to be a, a, a Hilbert space dimension that's higher than everything we're able to access. And that could manifest in the way. Then if we go back and we say, okay, now let's restrict everything to two level systems. It's not that, um, uh, it, it's kind of like a leakage of the quantum state into, into additional dimension. 
you know, you think of it as a reservoir, think of it as an additional dimension. But then what we're saying is, is that quantum mechanics is consistent with allowing the inner product change without having to apply a reality to um, the measurement side or these higher dimensions. Um, so we're not miniaturizing the apparatus. We're thinking of extra degrees of freedom as being concealed. Okay, so, so you need uh, to have a, in, in the spectrum of the apparatus, it's a quantum system, you need to have a big gap uh, from the subspace you are measuring to, to the other, I see. Okay, thank you. Or comments, questions? Yeah, well, maybe I would like to ask if your inner product changes and the norm changes, does also the energy changes? Uh, or is energy related to probability? Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, uh, you're, you're touching on a very important point that um, at the beginning of the presentation, I narrowed down. I just asked if things are consistent with quantum mechanics. Once we get to energy, um, we, there, there's two ways to think of the energy. One is the energy, um, which would be the physical quantity, the physical system. The other is whether energy is related to the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. So let me just, just ask you, Frieder, when you ask the question, are you thinking of energy in terms of eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, or are you thinking of it as a physical implementation? You see, at the onset of quantum mechanics, people were relating somehow probability densities to charges. Uh, then they figured out there could be probability even having a zero charge. And later I had the feeling probability in physics is related somehow to energy density. Uh, and the Hamiltonian, which makes the evolution of the system, somehow generates expectation values and everything. In your approach, you have here also evolution. And uh, so the, the, the object which somehow generates the evolution seems to be related to, to the Hamiltonian. So um, when, when, the, when you tell me now that in your inner product, there may be norm changes if you have open systems, I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, what, uh, what does the energy of the system, which would be somehow related uh, uh, to expectation values uh, observed. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand where your question is coming from. Let me turn the question into the following. Um, so what I like to think about is, you know, how was quantum mechanics born? Uh, one of the ways that quantum mechanics was born is in uh, spectroscopy. You know, just let's say we take the hydrogen atom and then the um, transitions between levels in a hydrogen atom reveal energy of that. So can I think that your question relates to saying something like, um, how would the spectrum of hydrogen change if the inner product changes? Is that a good physical question? Okay, yeah. So um, we, haven't, we haven't solved that yet, um, but it's something that I, I lie awake at night thinking about. So the question you're asking relates, I think, to some important physics. Let me tell you how I think about solving it and what the conclusions are, but it's just speculation. So if we write down, if I want to describe the hydrogen atom, and then um, I consider the lines of hydrogen, and in order to relate it to this qubit idea, I need to think about the spin half system of the electron. And then, so I write, I write down the hydrogen atom, you know, as some sort of bound electron, that there's um, fine structure splitting because of the, the spin half electron seeing the nucleus. And then I think of this Qtrit uh, simulation shown on this slide, then what happens is the electron, I could simulate it by thinking of the electron as secretly a three-level system instead of a two-level system. Um, that will then definitely have an impact on the energy levels. And, uh, and then the speculation we have, um, like mathematically, we would just either apply our quantum operation. So we'd modify Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom, or we would do this Qtrit simulation and their equivalent, as we know. Um, this would change the spectrum of hydrogen is what I believe in ways I don't fully understand. I don't understand what it would do to the widths of lines. I'm not yet clear how it would change the, um, uh, the fine structure. What I think would happen, and Shalini and Abhijit and I have been talking this through, is I think it would change the relative 
um, strengths of lines in a in a in the spectrum of an atom is how it would manifest. So my feeling and like we're showing it's consistent with quantum mechanics. Then the question you're asking, Frieder, is whether it's consistent with um, what we believe to be true or what we observe in energies of systems. And I think that there are mathematical consequences of that. How they stand up in, in the sense, like if I do spectroscopy, I'm also making use of Maxwell's equations to describe the interaction of light with the atom and what I need, how I need to treat the inner product change for Maxwell's equations on a classical level, I'm not sure how that would affect it. So the question you're asking is very important to me and one that I'm starting to ponder, um, but our work is, it's just outside the scope of our work. I think there will be physical consequences and we don't understand them yet. Any more comments, questions? If not, uh, let's uh, thank all three speakers again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.